always keeping in mind that we are so unworthy and we are nothing but Jesus is everything. He is center. He is everything. He is altogether lovely. Mighty to help and to deliver those persons that need help from above. Remember that God never works like we thought he would. He never does what we want him to do. He always does what we think not in a little way. We look for something great. He counts as a babe. We overlook what he is about to do most times we pass by what he's in unless we wait upon him long enough to be taught by the Holy Spirit how to discern his will the most wonderful thing you will ever do will be to trust the Lord with all your heart and not to lean to your own understanding and I'll say him Someone says, but my winning of souls, I win souls. You, know, you and I cannot win a soul at all without the Holy Spirit. And if you and I persuade a soul to come in by cesarean birth, there won't be a power enough to sustain them. And so the most wonderful thing you can do is to trust the Lord and obey him until the Holy Spirit leads. And when the Holy Spirit leads, They'll not come in with sustained birth. They'll come in by the power of soul travail. And they'll be born with a trusting heart. Because they'll be born by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So it's wonderful to recognize that God works in different ways than we had thought, esteemed, longed for, dictated you know lots of times we religious people were planning great things we're gonna have great services great singing great preaching when I hear that I go to nothing I go to nothing because I am nothing because all of us when we find out what we are we're nothing yet we're worth more than the earth that's a paradox isn't it the man that thinks himself to be something when he's nothing deceives himself. So he brings us to nothingness in order that he may be everything, all things. So God never works the way we had thought. He always works a little differently. It's to teach us sometimes to be quiet, to listen, and to be very, very still. I know that one man prayed, he walked with God, and the Lord began to reveal uh, himself to him, and so he began to pray, and he prayed one day, two days. I think he prayed nine days before he could get still enough to know what God wanted him to do. Prayed nine days to become still enough, quiet enough, so he could discern his will. And so therefore he wants us very, very much within, subdued, and just waiting. Just waiting on him. Trusting him. And so the secret is trusting. Denying ourselves and obeying the Holy Spirit. This is what he wants in the Church of God. This is what he designs and desires for all people that will follow Jesus. It's not accomplish great things necessarily. If they are, it'll be his. But just be faithful to a small assignment. A very, very, any assignment that he gives us. Always be as thrilled 
I, I'm sure that when the Lord began to work with me after years of walking with him, he began to teach my heart, and I'm only in the beginning, uh, that to be faithful over a little thing, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful in also that which is much. And if we are faithful in just a little assignment, a small assignment, really faithful, really true to this little assignment, then he may be able to trust us with a little more assignment, maybe no greater, maybe no higher. To see he is working with all of us, to see whether we, now he knows whether we're going to do it or not. He had the children of Israel those 40 years to prove what was in their heart because the men had doubted God, had unbelief. So he proves us. See, every step I take, every hour I make, he's proving you and me. He's proving concerning our heart, our inmost being. To see what is within us. He knows, but he wants to bring it to our attention. And many men have lived a lifetime and never known their capacity. Never known what they really could have been if only they would have trusted Jesus. Because they endeavored in their own strength. Because they endeavored in their own ability. Because they, they maneuvered in their own arrangements. Never really came to the place where they actually trusted in Jesus with all their heart. Now, there might be a slight bit of trust, but he wants a heart that will trust him entirely. Now, the Bible says Jesus did always those things which God wanted. Now, Jesus is the perfect example of a life of trust. In the New Testament, there is a life in the Old Testament that I see that is a is an example of trust, and that is Joseph. So God wills that we come to him in a life of trust, complete trust. And in the life of complete trust, there's no arrangements. And in the life of complete trust, there are no questions. But in the life of trust, all questions are answered in God's time, whether it's seconds, minutes, hours, weeks, years. Because he is the answer. But in the life of trust, there are no manipulations. I know in the first waiting or the second waiting, we, we have no program, but I had a very dear friend, and they said, now the gazers are here, and we want you to let them sing. So I was pressed to let them sing, world-known people. See, press. Pastors are pressed. If you have any carnal people or any driving people, they want to press you to do something. Right. They make a request. They want this. Now, this is not in the life of trust. In the life of trust, there are no programs of man, but in the life of trust, Christ, the Holy Spirit, is the leader, and he has it already. It's, it's not anything like we thought. It's not what we had dreamed. It is not what we want. But it's always in simplicity, and it's in a way that we had never thought at all. So in the life of trust, there's complete relaxation. There's not tenseness. Now, some people are trying so hard. They're just working so hard at this. God wants us to relax. 
like a little child. He said, except you be converted and become like little children. Now, if you ever saw or see a beautiful example of trust that's in a baby about five, six months old, say three months old, that's not spoiled. That little thing trusts its mother. Doesn't whimper or whine. Susanna Wesley brought all of her 15 to 18 children that lived, those three of them, four of them died. But she brought them all in six months' time to the place where they cried softly. She was an immaculate housekeeper. She was a scholar in languages and in scripture. But she brought all of her children to a place of crying softly whenever they cried. She knew how to temper the carnal by the guidance of the Holy Spirit in a life of trust. She learned this in trusting. She spent 15 minutes a day with each one of her children alone. But in the life of trust, there are, there's just complete relaxation. It's like a little babe. You could take a baby, and if it's well, not spoiled, you can just put it anywhere you want. It'll just bend. Oh, just anywhere. And it's not tense. So the Lord wants us relaxed. Just let loose. That's it. You're letting loose now. Just, just falling apart. The life of trust is perfect relaxation. The life of trust is anticipation of His will. For it's always new. Just like this morning, there'll never be another service like this. Never has been, never will be again. Last night there was never a service like that. Never was or never will be again. It never could be planned by man because we didn't know what Jesus wanted. So when we came here this morning, we did not know what Jesus wanted. We simply are just trusting. We're waiting before him. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. They shall wait. So the way of trusting, the trusting heart, does not manipulate or arrange. The trusting heart does not uh, try to engineer it or steer it. The trusting heart in his hands is a vessel. He works through and to guide him wheresoever God wills. <laughs> you see, when God has a plan, it's perfect. And when God has a plan, sometimes there's suffering. Always remember that suffering precedes compassion. So there is in the life of trust suffering. And when I say that this operates very deeply in my heart, if you can catch that, that'll be worth the revival. If you can grasp it. See, the flesh of us in the fall lost so much that we can't get a hold of some of these things that's the key and the secret of the spiritual walk with Jesus. Because we want great singing. We want great preaching. We want great programs. We want colorful things. We want it. The best is just to let him lead. And just walk slow. Because when you walk slow, he'll not let you miss any good thing that's around. And you can go over the same territory over and over and over and over for 20 to 100 times. And one day, God can show you something right there that you pass by all the time. How in the world did I miss that? Everyone in this place has had this experience. How did I miss this? So with the trusting heart, God never lets him miss anything. That's for him. Are you able to grasp that? For the trusting heart, God never lets the trusting heart miss anything 
That's for him. They say, here, here's a gold mine. Here's a treasure. Look at here. The world is left to be just scratch. No one can get the heart of it. It's diamond. And the trusting life, to learn to trust. Now the Holy Spirit operates within me, I will guide thee, direct thee, and tell thee what to do. In the life of trust is the only life he can guide. For as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. The Bible says, For as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. And God leads the trusting heart. He cannot lead the trustless heart. Neither can he lead the retaliating, resentful, murmuring, critical, disobedient, unbelieving heart. He leads the trusting heart. The trusting. So, the heart that simply rests upon the promise. The trusting heart is the heart that leans and rests and dwells under the shadow of the Almighty. Isn't that beautiful? The trusting heart is the heart that lives on the Word and in the Word of God. The revelation of Jesus. Trust has its existence in the fellowship of God. Trust has its essence and existence in Jesus Christ, in you, the hope of glory, as you wait and praise him and obey him. Trust ceases at disobedience. Trust cannot exist with any earthly manipulation. Trust cannot exist in an unbelieving heart. Trust ceases to exist in a cramped, pressed spirit. Now what the Lord is speaking through us now, I can never get again. It'll be by his mercies that we get anything. But each time, my wife says that through the 41 years, it's a little different. Some way in the life of trust, we simply wait, and it is different. It is new. In the life of trust, it is never monotony. It's never the same thing over and over and over and over. The life of trust is variation. But I want to get back to the life of trust. Trust is where we're completely in his hands, uh, happy with his appointments and his guidance, his direction. In the life of trust, there's great flowing of praise in the interior life. Now, I know that sometimes we're people, we have to praise the Lord in our heart. Or we might draw attention to self. But in the proper places where praise can be really exuberant and loud and out, then this is the time to praise him. But at all times, a trusting heart has a praise within the entire life. But the one standing next to you cannot always hear it. But in the light of praise, there is light and there is variation. And there's relaxation, and there's compliance with God's will, and there is delight in his purpose and in his plan. And in the life of trust, there is a sunrise that never sets. But we become as children. Because only a, only a childlike spirit will trust. Otherwise, it will take over and arrange. Now, if we could grasp that, that would teach us quite a lot. More than I could say. If we could only grasp it. 
Now, what you've heard, or what you've tried to hear here the last few minutes, is so basic in the walk with God, with Jesus Christ, that it is priceless in its uh, essence. If only we can maintain it, because the power of the air and the earthly man will rob you and take it from you and mash it out of you. Yes. The earthly schemes and the earthly power of darkness will try its best to take from you these gold nuggets that you have heard in the last few minutes just to try to take from us what the Lord has spoken through us. For I prayed 35 years ago, Lord, I want to be so close to thee and in thee so that we are nothing but thou art everything, so that you can speak the message through us to the persons that we're with, the very thing you would say if you were there. Because we, you and me, are Christ's ambassadors. We're his representatives. We're his, and we must be like him. Kind and gentle, full of love and joy and peace, long-suffering, jealous, goodness, faith, tempest, and weakness against that's the original law. And so he wants us. But he wants you so close to him that he can speak through you the need of the person that you're with. And you'll not speaking to, uh, be speaking to need, you'll be speaking the uplift. The help. Not the directions or instructions, but the help. The healing. The encouragement. For we are sent into the world not to do great things. See, lots of people want to do great things. Well, my precious family want me to become a great pastor in a great church. But God had other plans. He wanted this little servant to become nothing and walk down on a low path, real lowly at the bottom, and just meet his people wherever he would guide him and just wait on God. <laughs> See, we get the idea we have great things, wonderful things just to be accomplished. Well, the most wonderful thing you accomplish will be to trust him with all your heart and lean out to your own understanding. All your ways to acknowledge him and he'll direct you back. This is the, this is the wonderful assignment. He will work through you. It, there are those things he wants to accomplish. He will work them through you as the water runs through the brook, as the current in the globe. He will do it at his time. It may be only one accomplishment. It may be a many, a dozen, or less, or more. But in the life of trust, there's complete compliance with God's will. And he is... On the throne, he's never changed. And he wants to do, and he wants to work through you and me as his will, as you see. Uh, just a few weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, we were in Easton, Texas. And the pastor's wife had said to me <clears throat> when I called her husband, and both of them were there talking with me over the phone out in the state of Tennessee. I'd come in from West Virginia. She said, Reverend Helm, when the Holy Spirit revealed to you that you were coming to Easton, Texas, I knew it had to be God because if you knew how little this place was, you would never have come. I said, well, Sister Wilson, I said, if Jesus said so, we'd go around the world. I told her for one soul I got to think about, and if he said so, by God's grace, I always say, by God's grace, we'll do this or that we would have gone around the world just to be obedient if there hadn't been a soul saved. And when we arrived there at this little church, I think they had 10 or 12 persons, <clears throat> maybe of their own people, in this little church. She said one night, uh, the night that a pilot flew a pastor from Arlington, Texas, and another man over there, 
the three men, two of them I had never seen before. I had known the pastor for years gone by. And she uh, got up, the pastor's wife, and she said, I don't know why God led Reverend Hill to this little church. She said, I don't know why yet. And this pilot that I had never seen that flew this plane over from Arlington, Texas, he got up and he said, I'll tell you one reason why. He led him here to teach me how to love people. Yes, sir. Well, to me, that is very precious. <clears throat> when he came in, my wife said he was rather downhearted and pressed, just like most people are when they come in. You can tell they've just, been, they've just had a hard day. It's been a kind of a gloomy time, you know. They have that look, you know, like the world looks. We just look like we're pretty well forlorn sometimes. But this precious one, the longer was there, the more he was lifted. Yes, Jesus, the Holy Ghost, just lifted him. Yes. And we were talking about love and how God has called us in Jesus Christ to love people, to love everyone as Jesus loved us. And so he said, I know one reason why he, why he brought him. He brought him here to teach me how to love people. So I, had, I said, come up and let me love you now. So this beautiful young man, 37 years of age, came up, and I loved him. When I loved him, I prayed for the struggles of his life, his heartaches, uh, different things that came to my mind. I prayed, and finally, the Holy Spirit spoke through me, and take care of that, Lord, that situation that's ahead of him. Take care of this. And it, it came right through by the Holy Spirit, and he looked at me with a shock. I said, it'll work out. You just trust Jesus about that. But God taught us, has been teaching us a little bit about loving each other in a holy way, in a holy way, in holiness, not an earthly way, but in a heavenly way. Men love men so far as loving people in the church and women love women in the church not men loving women in the church sometimes people get excited and they do that but it is ought not to be done it's just not pure and there's too much danger in it but we're taught to love inwardly to love unselfishly to love as christ loved so it is a joy to distrust jesus We want to learn so much. We want to learn new things. But actually what we need is just to trust it. And we'll learn everything that's needed. Can we hear that? Are we able? See, when Jesus spoke, they couldn't hear what he said. Did you know that? See, he was perfect. No sin at all. Without sin. He made the world. He came to the world and the world didn't know him. The world that he made didn't recognize him. He came to his own, his own received him not. When he spoke, the people, they said the poor people received him gladly. But we couldn't hear very well what he said. So he has called us to trust him, just to trust him. And only the trusting heart can hear. You pastors, if there's more than another pastor here, there's two or three, four pastors here, preachers, this morning. The people that hear what God speaks to you when it's of the Holy Spirit, the people that hear it are the people that trusts and obeys God. You take all the persons that whippered and whined and downfall and manipulating and doing things their way all way, they can't hear what you say. Right. 
because only the trusting, obedient heart can hear. Obeying the Holy Spirit is the way we learn. I have learned by God's grace the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the operation of the Holy Spirit, the direction of the Holy Spirit, only by obeying every leading he's given me, each leading through the years. And any time that I have missed any of the leadings of the Holy Spirit, if I knew it, it always broke my heart. It always made me feel unhappy, very, very sorry. So I have endeavored by God's grace to obey him each day. So I have only learned as we've obeyed. It's by his mercies I would ever have anything else again. It gives the Lord all the glory, all the praise, all the honor for each of his revelations because God reveals himself to the trusting heart and the trusting heart is the heart that fears God and the Bible says that the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. Always remember that love and fear as I said last night go together and the heart that loves and fears God is the heart that trusts God. It's not anxious, not pressing, not pulling and finagling, you know, but just, just trust, relax, waiting. You say, Brother Helm, well, you were anticipating a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit in 1942. Yes, I was. I was anticipating. I was trusting. 43, trusting. Yes, just trusting. I'd hear somebody say where we were, oh, this is what it's going to be. So oh, this is it. Oh, I said, oh, blessed Jesus. Have mercy upon us. So the trusting heart is simply in the hands of the Lord, willing to wait, willing to go, willing to do his will. So when the Holy Spirit revealed to me in 1941, because he had been working with me years before that, and we were striving to obey his leading in the night, in the day, having me to get up in the night and send on a journey. We've been striving for nine years, eight to nine years, to do what God wanted. Yea, through the years before, we were striving. I remember in 1941, our district superintendent's son and I was looking out the window of the classroom. We were taking Greek one or two, I've forgotten Greek one, I believe. And we were looking out at uh, the break, five minute break. And he was saying, well, you know, I wouldn't want my people to really know some things that I think. And I said, oh, my brother, I'd give anything if all my church people could see my heart. 